News Radio 700 WLW. So in the midst of, uh, I think it's clear there is a revolution of sorts when it comes to technology and the idea of AI, whether it's writing stories for magazines and newspapers online to creations of all sorts of things. Uh, and maybe in many cases, the idea that the machines could take us over. Elon Musk and other experts in that field have asked for a, a pause, a delay in any further development of such for like six months or more as they try to figure out, I guess, what the future may hold and to maybe keep the machines from taking over. But something that maybe is a little bit more relatable, that maybe is a little bit more of a danger than the, the machines taking us out is people using this artificial intelligence to create things that they would not have been able to otherwise and then maybe cashing in. And who has ownership to this and where are the ethics associated with it? And a guy who uh, deals with patents and, and an interesting piece talking about the creation of, of things with the AI is John Risby. He's an attorney, kind enough to give us some time dealing with uh, He's known as, uh, the, what do we call yourself there, John? Welcome to 700 WLW with Sterling. You are like the patent guy, right? Uh, the patent professor, the, yes. The patent professor. Well, let, let's get some education. I think it makes sense. We're due for some education in this. W where is the line? And I guess the, part of this conversation is there's a, a woman who put out a, a book and, and allowed the art to be created by artificial intelligence. And then the question is, who owns the art? Who should get paid? And, and wh what is the, the allowable use of arts created by the machines, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there might be a little bit of, of history might help to really understand the context. Um, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there's that monkey selfie case, as it's known, where a photographer had uh, forgotten their cell phone. It was picked up by a monkey who took a bunch of selfies that ended up being incredibly valuable, uh, went viral. And because it was his cell phone that was used, he filed for the copyright. And the copyright office uh, said that, you know, based on the, where the, the law derives constitutionally, an author has to be a human being, and uh, the, the copyright was denied. So that's kind of the, the crux of the issue with computer-generated art and computer-generated content, whether it's text or, or graphics, is how much of the creativity is uh, done by a human being and how much of it is done, uh, I, wouldn't know, I wouldn't, don't even know if I'd call it creativity, or how much of the work is done by the computer. I say it's not creativity because they're basically uh, crawling the Internet and a database of billions of, of documents that are already created, and that's the base material. So there's, uh, and, and, and a, the human in this aspect is just putting in a simple query into the program and not doing the actual work. Now, the... The proponents who are, are uh, claiming that there should be copyright protection for this are saying that the computer is no different than a paintbrush would be for a painter. It's just a tool, and the actual creativity is still uh, with the human being. And that's, you know, that I don't know uh, what you think about that, but I, I certainly think there's a difference between a paintbrush, a painter using a paintbrush versus uh, uh, the sophistication of some of these AI programs where you simply would put in what you want drawn and voila, in two minutes you have the, the whole art piece done. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree with that. I mean, there's a difference between, you know, utilizing that brush and letting your hand do the work rather than it being someone else and you putting your name on it. Or, but if you buy the computer, you buy the software, and it creates it, is an architect still with using software helping to design my home or my business or my yard and landscaping? Or is that then the computers, and then you have to say, well, who created the concept in, in the program that th those people are using their talents to create something else with it? It is a tool, but it gets weird. It, it gets weird because it's a tool way more powerful than anything we've seen. I mean, there's some people would say, well, you know what, uh, you know, Photoshop is a program, and people use Photoshop to create, to manipulate uh, images all the time. And I think the difference is the creative control. You actually have the mouse in your hand, your keyboards, you're, you're making uh, direct edits, you're, uh, there's a lot more activity. You're not simply putting in... Uh, uh, a query like you know uh, draw me a frog with a horse's head <laughs> and then two minutes later voila it's there like there's there's, there's a fundamental difference between a tool such as a paintbrush they also use the example of a chisel well it's you know it's this is way more sophisticated than a chisel whereas every single hit is done by with your hands with a, a hammer and there's a lot more creativity involved here 
that, you know, that, that's, that's the difference. Like, is this, who is the actual author and is it a, a human? Because if not, then uh, a machine cannot own rights to a copyright. John Risby, by the way, is the uh, patent professor talking about the issues of artificial intelligence uh, creating art or things, stuff, and who owns the right to what that creation is, generally speaking, with Sterling on a, a Wednesday night, 700 WLW. So as we look at this, what is the – say, for instance, I buy a 3D printer. And, and you know they're building houses with 3D printers. They're doing a lot of things with 3D printers, and you can get programs that would then help design things and so forth. And, and there are elements that you may pick and choose from one place or another to go with it. I, I, I guess it gets deep as far as who has ownership. If you, I mean, who owns the technology that is the artificial intelligence? And is then that who is chasing money or a copyright for, say, like the story about the, the girl who put that story out there and it created, like, the artwork to go along with it that sort of was the crux to, of this initial conversation? Yeah, so, uh, so, so she's kind of testing the, the limits of, you know, in the, the her original uh, uh, application was granted for a copyright, and then the copyright office, did a 180 they changed course and said well wait a minute there's no there's no human authorship here and therefore there's there's no copyrights because in that case there literally was uh uh you know almost no uh control creative control on her part of the output so now what she's doing is uh is going through and now it's going to be this is really what's going to test is how much is enough uh, there's a new program called Stable Diffusion where you scan in your own drawings. So the initial drawings are extremely rough hand drawings that you scan in, and then you do uh, put some queries, some terms in, and it manipulates your original hand drawings. And this is really going to tell kind of if that's enough, because now uh, there is that element of, of, of creative control uh, where you have a lot more input at the beginning it's still an, an un incredibly powerful tool so it's it's nowhere nowhere close to you know like a, a paintbrush or a chisel uh but it's it's still um still a, a a lot more creativity than simply putting in the terms and asking it to to draw like going back to my example of a frog with a horse's head right in this case with uh with stable diffusion you you could do a a, a, a rough sketch with, you know, it could look like a, a kindergartner's crayon drawing of a frog with a horse's head, scan it into this program, and then use a text query to explain what you're trying to draw. The artificial intelligence would look at your hand-drawn sketch, look at the query, and based on those would create a, uh, a final drawing. And the hope is that this would then be enough uh, creative control on the part of a human to uh, to provide authorship uh, uh, for the creator and therefore copyrights will apply. Man, I can see all kinds of ways this could be argued and manipulated. John Rizvi uh, is a patent professor uh, talking about well, who can own art created by or anything created by artificial intelligence with Sterling on the big one. So, say for instance, I mean, what's the classic story? Like the guy who came up with like carbon paper or whatever it was, or even post-it notes, I think. They, they come up with it. They may have gotten a small bonus. It was a part of their job for a company that they worked for. Then the company owns what they created and then for whatever period of time has ownership of that, correct? That, that's correct. If you're, uh, uh, and a lot of that depends on the uh, employment agreement. But most employment agreements do include a clause that any intellectual property you, you produce uh, during the course of your employment belongs to the employer. And as far as, say, for instance, like right now, if you're looking to write something, you can go into like the open chat uh, AI or whatever and give them ideas, come up with questions, come up with the writing. I mean, at this point, I have friends who are educators, and they have to basically check their students' work to see if it's been heisted from someplace. Now, they have software to search for something that could have been stolen elsewhere, not just reworded works and thoughts to something that they're regurgitating. I, I mean, there are so many levels and layers to this. I mean, it gets very complicated. I mean, it's it's really hard to fathom. This Christina Kashtanova, who is the graphic novelist behind this in the Zrea of the Dawn, which is in the midst of this conversation about the art and the words. So she owns the words to what she wrote in those stories, but the creative portion and the art, which was artificially created. 
then is that open source now, like open licensing for like art or photos that's on the internet that people use? And if you're not careful, if you post it on social media or otherwise, someone can come at you. I mean, that's an area where you know somebody like you looks to to get some billable hours, right? <laughs> yeah, but, well, and and oh my God, there's 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 just so much, uh, uh, so many different angles to this. One is whether the uh, Christina, for example, whether she can get uh, copyright protection herself. But another completely different issue is uh, all of the uh, – there's a lot of lawsuits because all of that existing material that exists that's being, uh, you know, utilized to create this, that's, that's – uh, there's a class action claiming infringement, that there's, there's, there's got to be uh, compensation for the original artist because – the computer doesn't have its own creativity. It's simply compiling from existing uh, material that's out there. Um, one, one big distinction in, in Casanova's case is that the, the copyright office, when they denied the copyright, one big factor was that the software program was called Mid-Journey. It does not allow any editing after the computer spits back, uh, you know, the, the image. Gotcha. So there's no human interaction at all uh that that's a potential weakness um in the copyright office's uh stance deny denying uh copyrights for uh, uh ai generated material because uh you know clearly these companies are learning from this case they're following it and their the later programs allow for editing after the computer generates the uh, you know the, the content. So for ChatGPT, for example, uh, if you get if if you put in terms that say give me a, a, a 150 word essay about uh, photosynthesis and how it works, <laughs> it's going to generate content. It's going to give that to you. Uh, one way to to become the author is you take that raw material and and reword you edit it. it. It's yeah. Good, reword yeah. it. Yeah. And and it doesn't take a lot before. You've edited it, and now you've got the human control, and you, now you can file for a copyright. So that's, that was one of the big drawbacks in mid-journey, which prevented uh, you know, the, the copyright office from finding any authorship, is that there's no editing permitted after the final product. This is all and crazy a, talk, you know. I, I mean, but to a certain extent, it, it, it seems so out there, but it, it is so now at this point. And, and law is behind technology and science. It has always been that way, but it seems like it's really behind in some ways. I, I, I got to ask, because I mean, I know you put out books like Escaping the Gray, Think and Grow Risk for Investors. You, you got the patentprofessor.com. You were one of the original sharks, as I understand, on the Shark Tank. Uh, I mean, you You've been around, you know, issues of patenting and so forth. We have problems enforcing that with China, nation states other than that, let alone courts and other countries we have agreements with where they don't follow along with our tri uh, tr uh, trademarks and copyrights and infringe upon those, not even for knockoff goods, just for other things in their markets as well that – I mean, just with Russia recently, with all the stuff that went down, you know, with Ukraine, as far as McDonald's and so on, selling more or less the same product, but yanking the golden arches off and a lot of weird stuff like that. This is the same type of concept. It's just a machine creating all of it, right? It's, it is. It's, um, and it just brings, you know, it's, it's funny that the, uh, to, to go back to the original constitutional basis for intellectual property, for protecting the rights of authors, and and it's going back to you know what did the the founders envision by authors uh they clearly did not envision an author to be a computer uh, yeah, uh you're sure. right they didn't and as the monkey selfie case kind of <laughs> shows us that they didn't it, it, it envision an author to be a monkey either an author is a human being and there has to be creative control exerted by by a human in creating content uh, the question just becomes one of degrees, like when, at which point does the tool become so incredibly powerful that it is doing a lot of the creative work that otherwise a human would be? Like this is like, you know, some of these, these new AI-based programs are like, like Photoshop on steroids because oh, yeah. you're, you're, you're the human element is, uh, input is, is minor and most of the work, most of the, uh, creative control is in the part of uh, the machine. Now, there's that loophole that I mentioned. Is if these, uh, if this AI uh, uh, software allows for the human 
after the content is fully created to go back and make edits, now you're talk now now you're now it's a, the the copyright office is in a tough position. Like who's to determine that the editing is not enough creative control. Well, yeah, but and I mean, look, I can pay an editor to help me fix a paper I've written. I'm still going to turn the paper, and the, the person who edited it just get a couple bucks, right? So what's the difference if it's technology doing the editing and me doing the creation that it's being edited, right? Right. Well, the, the big difference would be is now <laughs> if, if you edit it yourself, you own the copyright to it, and and now they can't use the – they can't reject it based on – uh, there not being enough creative control by a human being because if the programs allow the human to step in once it's done uh, and make changes, you know, then then they can still get the copyright. And we all know it's a lot easier. As, you know, the, like the it, it's always easier being a critic uh, than it is to create the original work. So sure. to come back after the computer's done it and go back and make some minor inconsequential changes. Uh, that's easy, yeah, and that's true. and if that's, that's true. what all it takes to entitle someone to a copyright, then that's a really low bar for them to to meet in order to get entitled to protection. Yeah, I mean, and at this point, I mean, there's so much work that, in the creative realm that is somewhat derivative anyway. It gets deep, and people fight those issues for service mark, copyright, trademarking, et cetera, too, which obviously you know a lot about. The patentprofessor.com, the webpage. John Risby, thank you for making time. I don't know if I'm, I'm in a better place of, of figuring out what's my work and what's somebody else's, but it, it gets deep, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out right now before the machines take over, and we all have a lot of free time on our hands. <laughs> so, exactly. Take care of yourself. Exactly. Uh, appreciate your time. Hope to have you back again soon. The patentprofessor.com, John Risby with Sterling on the big one.